Tara right here. You may have seen me around Top Music, bringing you content, socials, and managing Top Music Marketplace. I just wanted to pop in and invite you to our Plan Your Best Year Challenge. This challenge is taking place January 4th through the 6th. Each day, we will unpack what actually happened in 2022 and how we can use that information moving forward in 2023. We will also give you a homework assignment each day for you to complete and share. And when you do this, you'll get the opportunity to win one of our many amazing prizes. We'll set up a pop-up Facebook group where we will go live each day and it will give you a place to share your homework, ask questions, and enjoy the cohort group experience. Register at topmusic.co forward slash challenge to sign up for this challenge. I hope to see you there. You're listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. Tune in weekly as we interview music teachers and experts from around the world to explore creative activities and ideas that build learning connections in students. Our integrated music teaching approach will deepen your students' understanding of musical concepts, engage them in critical thinking, improve their reading and performance, foster their curiosity, and prepare them for a lifetime of music making. I'm Tim Topham, and welcome back to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. It's wonderful to be with you again for another week, and as we round out this year, uh, we're getting very close to Christmas now. I hope everyone's got their shopping organized. <laughs> and this episode is all about a topic that has been around for many, many years and has only grown in popularity and interest. And uh, I'm only surprised that I haven't covered this topic before on the podcast. Um, so, it's really great to talk about it. What we're talking about today is the narrow key pianos that are starting to emerge and have been emerging for. 10 years or more actually, but we're going to talk about where we're at with the whole process, what we're talking about, what the different sizes are, how it all works, and I can't wait to kind of share this with you. And I've got two fabulous interviewees who I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. At Top Music, we love guiding and supporting music teachers to engage, motivate, and inspire your students and to run the most sustainable studio business possible using our integrated music teaching model. So, no matter what instrument you teach or whether you teach online or in person, groups or individuals or whether your students are four years old or 94, we're here to support and guide you to give you confidence and help you feel a little less isolated in your studio. And if you'd like to find out how we can do that most effectively through our Top Music Pro membership, just head over to topmusicpro.com. So, my two guests today are Linda Gould and Rhonda Boyle. Linda is the author of play piano chords today and has been teaching and performing for five decades. Linda has an ARCT and B master in performance with distinction and a minor in math. She's a competition and exam award winner and recently won Tech Teacher of the Year. And Rhonda Boyle studied piano as a child, but her small hands discouraged her from pursuing a career in music. She has tertiary qualifications in science, environmental science and urban planning, and her career was mostly in the Victorian state government here in Australia. Rhonda returned to the piano in 1999 as a student of Robert Chamberlain. She stumbled across the Steinbühler keyboards on the internet at the start of 2007 and acquired a DS 5.5 keyboard for her piano in 2009. And you'll find out what that number actually means shortly. She's since been involved in research relating to hand size and piano playing, presenting at conferences in Australia, USA and Europe, and contributing articles to various journals. Well, welcome to the show, Rhonda and Linda. It's great to have you both with me. Hi, Tim. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to be with you, Tim. It's actually been uh, quite some time that you guys have been uh, talking about narrow key piano. And this com- this uh, podcast has been going for five or six years and I haven't ever had this as a discussion point, which I think it's high time that we did have this discussion <laughs> because you guys are on quite a crusade and I want to talk about a little bit about the history and why you're so passionate about it and also answer some teacher questions about what they can do to find out more as well. And Linda, great to have you on the show as well because you're one of our Evolution members and you've always got a ton of projects on the go Um, and we might find out about some of them a little bit later on. But firstly, maybe for you, Linda, can you just give us a sense of the history of this movement? Just before I hit record, you said you started this 30, well, you didn't start it necessarily, but you were involved 30 years ago. 
which actually kind of blew my mind. So tell me a little bit about where this all came from and when it started. Right. Uh, 30 years ago, when I was six years old, <laughs> not really, um, <laughs> I wish, <laughs> but I, I met up with David Steinbuehler through a um, old university friend, Chris. Chris and I had been chatting for years about how we had small hands and uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just rip them off and stick a large hand on. And through the course of all of this, we've realized that keys have been changing over the course of the last 300 years. This is not something new, but it's only in the last 100 years that it's created this six and a half inch octave that we all have grown to love and hate. And, uh, and so we just thought, is this, is this absolutely necessary? And so uh, this movement started with, um, well, it actually started even before this. I'll tell you a little bit of that history very briefly, but it started with David Steinbuehler actually creating a retrofit for my Yamaha Grand. I was the first commercial purchaser. And Rhonda was the first commercial purchaser in the, uh, Australia about 10 years later. And we've just slowly, he's been making these. Uh, he is an absolute saint. And yeah, so who is David Stein, Steinberger, did you say? Steinbuehler. Bueller. Yeah, Steinbuehler. He is, um, he is a, um, a textile manufacturer in Titusville, Pennsylvania, who is an inventor and engineer, um, has large hands, and um, uh, but his mom also played. And so he just, he's done it through love and passion. But I wanted to say that, in 1941, a piano tuner wrote a book saying that a new possibilities of the keyboard. This has been talked about for a long time ago. And he said, uh, having discussed this topic with many music teachers since 1931, it appears certain that a reduced octave would meet public acclaim and pianos of this kind ought to sell like hotcakes. Well, no way, this is 90 about. years ago. So this is, this is not new. What is new is... David finally started making these, and there's about two or 300 of them out there in the world, but it hasn't caught on like wildfire because it's really expensive. And so we're trying to evolve that into some digital products that are more portable and more affordable. And, um, but it has, uh, the last 30 years has just been such a coaster, a roller coaster ride of um, events and things that have been happening. Wow. Okay. So in the, so the first uh, iterations of a narrow keyboard were a, an insert for a grand piano. So you take the current grand piano action out and you put in a smaller one that still hit all the same strings on the inside. So the the um, keys were all kind of angled differently. Kind right. Of the backs yeah. of the fingers where you can't see in your hand, they all had angles. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Got it. Um, and you both had one of them and one of the first ones and they were created by this um, David person for love and fun. Um, is, is he sort of involved in this uh, still today? Quite passionately? It is. Yes, he's becoming a second generation. Actually, his grandson is starting to take this over because he is um, starting to get past that. <laughs> right. Okay. And and so I was interested, I'm sorry, Rhonda, Rhonda just one more question as well. You, you mentioned the piano keys varied in size for the first couple of hundred or so the piano, let's say is 250 years old. Is that about right? Or 300 the, is, years old? The piano. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 1711. Yeah. Actually okay. like 400 now. 400. Okay. And so in the course of the first few hundred years, I'm assuming they changed a fair bit because organ keys and harpsichord were much well, thinner, I think. And eventually a standard was set upon, was agreed upon. Yes. Uh, Joseph Hoffman, a hundred years ago, was able to get a slightly narrower key for his piano. And uh, there have been a little, little size, but generally it was in the last hundred years, it's been 6.5 because we need these large, we have these large concert halls. And uh, we need these big pianos. But the size of the key doesn't affect the size of the sound that can come out of the piano, right? Because that's dependent on the strings and the soundboard, etc. Correct. Right. Well, no, perhaps I. Sorry, I could mention there the it, the size today dates back to the eighteen eighties with the big companies Steinway, Erard, Playel working with male virtuoso pianists, and they wanted a bigger sound and. Part of that revolution, I suppose, in design was changing from straight strings to cross string. And that design suited wider keys as well. It, so it has kind of set a legacy in a way for all acoustic pianos with the cross strung design. 
it makes it harder to have keys in a technologically sense to um, have narrow keys. And so it's, we're sort of locked into that history. And at the time, of course, in the 1880s, women didn't play in public very much. That wasn't acceptable. They had to play feminine repertoire at home and entertain the family and suitors. And so they weren't, men didn't like them playing flashy romantic repertoire in concert halls. But they were teachers, you know, they taught and they played well, but. Um, they weren't allowed out, sort of, so to speak. <laughs> and we Isn't still it? have, so we're left with that legacy from the 1880s today still. In the size of the keys, thankfully not in the fact that um, women aren't, aren't professional performers, which is uh, it's great to see how many women there are performing now. But I understand well, are, your point. That, and that is another uh, uh, thing that uh, Rhonda has researched on how many women actually win the competitions uh, versus male, how many women actually even get to the finals. And so it is still very much a male-dominated field. We have definitely some women, but these are unusual. They have the larger hands. And so I can see now why the moves that you in particular, Linda, have more recently made to digital instruments um, make sense in some ways because, I, well, mind you, building new digital instruments from scratch with all of the manufacturing of that would be expensive. Uh, so it's huge. I, yeah, yeah, I, I can't even imagine um, what what it would what it would take. So I'm interested to dive into that because there seems to be. It sounds like to me there's a great groundswell of interest from various uh, pianists in this concept, but the challenge is to convince manufacturers that they should invest in this because I guess they're like, I don't know if there's enough interest in this to to cover the investment, which would be substantial for their factories. Is, would, would that be a good summary of where you're at? Yes. The male, um, the um, piano manufacturing industry is very male dominated and it is, uh, they just, they don't get it. And uh, I know that they have a balance sheet that they have to um, uh, live for, but um, I have, uh, I and Rhonda and various other members of the, the PASC team have approached the big three many, many times, and they are just firmly not interested. They don't see a market for it. And until they do, they're not going to do it, which is one of the reasons why we're just trying to do what we can to be the seeds and the catalyst because, um, you know, Yamaha, Roland, Casio, they make amazing digital pianos, but they're just not going to until we show them that there is a huge market, which is changing. It's really changing the amount of people that are comfortable with the idea. Well, Rhonda, I wanted to ask about pa uh, PASC, which uh, Linda just mentioned. For those who aren't aware, PASC is, stands for Pianists for Alternatively Sized Keyboards at pascpiano.org. Uh, you can find out more about that. Uh, Rhonda, I believe this is your uh, baby. <laughs> Tell us about it because uh, I think, you. I mean, this is just more of the uh, research and information you're putting all into one place. Yeah. Well, look, it started off for me, I started off doing research after I got my keyboard and presented at numerous conferences, particularly here, the Australasian Piano Pedagogy Conferences. We've teamed up with Erica Booker in Sydney, who's um, got the studio there with three different sized piano keyboards. So, but in 2013, I suppose we it evolved more into a campaign. Certainly the research is a key underpinning of it all, but the aim is we want to see the widespread availability of two alternative sizes, and these are the DS sizes or the DS standards have been defined by David Steinbuehler. So we have the current size at 6.5-inch octave. apologise for using inches, but it all comes from America. Um, the two smaller sizes, 6.6-inch octave and the 5.5, which Linda's been talking about. Now, the the 5.5 compared to the 6.5 is an inch difference. So in playing an octave, it's like playing on a seventh on a normal keyboard. But that represents the difference in male and ha female hand spans. There's, there's plenty, been plenty of research, and we've done a big study of Australian pianists measuring hand spans, nearly 500 pianists, there is that one inch difference in 
just the, that stretch one to, from thumb to fifth finger, and that is very significant. That's it's uh, either, you've measured it when people stretch out a comfortable yeah. stretch wide. Yeah. Well, that's we measure the maximum stretch to get consistency with how you measure different people, but but basically there's that one inch difference, and that's consistent, and there's a slight ethnic difference as well between Asians and Caucasians, but the gender difference is very stark and has big implications for playing, just playing standard repertoire like Beethoven, Schubert, Chopin, that the octaves are tense and very stretched out, there's no power, all all of those sorts of things. So it, it sort of makes sense when you look at the competition results at the top level as a Easy explanation. So the aim of PASC, and I suppose it evolved in about 2013 when Carol Leone from Dallas Southern Methodist University, they're the world leaders in this movement in, in the academia, was out here at a conference and she and Erica and I conceived of the idea of a, a bit of a campaign and maybe doing a petition, which we have done, and so it needed a name. So it's at that point, I guess, for me, the research kind of morphed into campaign mode as well. And that's um, obviously the website is there and I maintain a mailing list. There's a lot of social media activity, particularly Facebook. You know, I, I get emails all the time from people and I'm often wanting to help and what can I do and I put some people in touch with other people and as a result of that, things happen like in Europe today with a, another digital keyboard. So it's the aim is that the, the, the two alternative sizes, particularly 6.0, 5.5, um, should be widely available uh, as mainstream options, not as sort of niche market options, but mainstream options. It would make, I mean, it makes sense to me to look at the digital uh, area because not everyone has a grand piano as well. In fact, pr- a few students would and studios in that fact would have grand pianos, I would expect. And so even if you could mass manufacture alternate grand piano actions, that may not be the best way to go forward. So I, I'm I'm interested to find out more, um, Linda, particularly in about your um, experience, because you actually exhibited at NAM, which is super exciting. And then Rhonda, you, you mentioned another keyboard that's coming out of um, the U, uh, EU. So we might come back to that one. But Linda, firstly, tell us about NAM and narrowkeys.com, which is your site. Is this something that you're personally driving and financing? Uh, I, I have, yes, I have a partner, Kathy uh, Stroke, and myself. Uh, she's in the United States, I'm in Canada. And uh, we have uh, been working with the amazing uh, Dave Starkey and Chuck Johnson, creating a custom, our first, we created three prototypes and we took two of them to the NAM show, which was so much fun because it's the first time we've gotten together after COVID. So the buzz was just amazing. There's a great video that people can watch too. Um, where did I see that? Is that on, that's on your website, isn't it? On narrow. Uh, we've, we've got a few videos on the, uh, yeah, people just dropping by and jamming with them and uh, playing. And I was blown away. First of all, it is mostly male. It's a male dominated thing. So I would say I saw 90 males to every t- uh, 10 females, but they all tried it. They were all excited as well. I was blown away by how fast people got accustomed to it and uh, what they could do like right off the bat. We had one sitting where you could sit down with headphones and try it. But uh, Joey D. Francesco, the famous organist, jazz organist, he came by and tried it. Almost got Stevie Wonder to try it. He walked by, <laughs> oh my God, but uh, he was a little busy. <laughs> and I thought it would have been amazing because, you know, so many people think that an octave is just emblazoned in our hand and we 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 play the keyboard like we play braille uh braille was invented by a french organist and and it's about feeling the black keys and as soon as you feel where those three black keys are and those two black keys you can just adapt between the keyboards uh very easily so um we had lots of interest um we had uh, berkeley school of music um the big jazz school they came by and they thought this would be a fabulous addition to their group piano studio we had a lot of actually other music studios uh, music schools in the United States have thought, you know, these are smaller and we have a lot of 
females and uh, and especially teens, they're going through a huge amount of growth. They get tendonitis really easily and they don't. The, the lack of injury is fabulous when the keys fit the hand. Uh, I, I remember playing one, I think Rhonda, at one of our Australian conferences and I was surpri- super surprised at how quickly my brain adapted to to the new size it was i was not making mistakes left front and center it was very quick uh, it really surprised me actually um because yeah you do think oh i've, I've played this for 30 years or what 20 years it must be ingrained that that's it i wonder though i don't think i'd practice jumps i wonder if i tried to do leaps like in chopin or something whether i would hit those guys. <laughs> uh, linda's no, got one of, the, one of the digitals right next to her it looks fantastic yeah. by the way Sometimes I say it's a bit like learning to climb sets of stairs. When we're toddlers, we learn to climb steps, but then all sets of stairs you come to, they're all different. And we don't, we just glance at the first one. We don't think, oh, it's different to what I learned to climb, you know, that 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 height of each step. So it's as you say, it's that's something people and and probably in the 1800s, people knew that they were adaptable and of course, no one. There's no one around today that was alive in the 1800s. And, and I guess you know, I, I I used to play organ as well, and I don't know if now organ keys are the same width, but they feel thinner to me. I'm not sure. Maybe they are. So many um, uh, rock and roll pianists, they'll play or jazz pianists, they'll play regular keys with one hand, and they've got a little con- mini controller playing the other hand. So they're playing two different size keys at oh, the same yes. time. Yep. And, and it's not an issue because of the black keys. Um, and the controllers are a five and a half inch octave, but they're not good enough to actually play piano on. And Linda, you mentioned, uh, was it Dave and Chuck or something? Who are they and where do they, what do they do? So Dave Starkey and Chuck, uh, Char- yeah, Charles Johnson, Chuck Johnson, um, they uh, created the circular piano. You may have seen oh, it in one of yeah. Lady Gaga's. And we figured if you can make a piano in a circle, you <laughs> should be able to make a digital narrow. Um, it's huge. Yeah, they, they, what we've gone through with them has been uh, nothing short of uh, miraculous. And as you say, all the software programming, um, Dave has put in the brand new MIDI 2.0, which is just out there, which makes the piano so sensitive. Um, but it has been, it's not just, you know, narrow down the keys and we're good to go. And then add in COVID and circuit boards and availability. And, oh, of um, course, yeah. It, it's been slower than we expected, but it's uh, happening. So who's manufacturing it or is it just piece by piece? Someone's like literally building this thing in their garage. We have a we have a factory we're working with. It's a prototype factory in Boston, and they're making them one at a time, which is why the cost is is high for a keyboard. Um, and uh, as soon as we get the first ten produced this fall, then we are going to move to another factory that can make them a hundred at a time. Also in the United States, the goal is to keep the manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, just for. For many reasons, but um, at that point, we you know there's the investment goes up and molds, and so we're taking it a step at a time. But uh, we are very very serious about um, getting these out there, and we have a huge number of people that are so passionate in their comments that are just waiting, and they check in every once in a while. Still coming, still coming. What would be the cost right now for a digital piano? So this uh, the the ten that we're producing this fall we're um, hoping to be forty five hundred dollars U S four thousand five hundred uh, if we can shave any off of that we will but that will be for the ten uh, the goal is to get get it down we're never going to get it down to a thousand dollars but we will uh, the more affordable we can make it the more we can make it one time then definitely it's a volume thing you can reduce the costs. Uh, Rhonda, I was going to ask you about the, the, so while Linda's working on this in Canada, there's uh, another one in um, the EU, is that right? Yes, in um, and I keep in touch with the guy there. There's a Dutchman called Thomas Kaduk who several years ago made a, again, like David Steinmuller, he has no background in pianos. He's an industrial design IT person and he made a, acoustic retrofit keyboard for a Dutch pianist, a uh, 5.5, and used a totally different action. I haven't seen it, but it uses ball bearings. I, I don't understand. Anyway, that's the only one he did, and he's got this vision of the perfect instrument to suit every musician. That's his vision. 
But then just the start of the pandemic, 2020, a Frenchman got in touch with me and said, oh, what can I do? I want to help. And often I just put people in touch with other people in Europe. And he t- he got in touch with Thomas and convinced him to go digital. And so that's what Thomas has done. He's setting up manufacturing in Poland. He's actually shifting to Poland. It's but basically he's done all the testing and developed prototypes, but he can't complete the first pre-orders because there's certain specialised computer chips that he needs, and that's delaying things. But it's certainly it'll be a more expensive product than Linda's, and his aim is to create, um, and you can look at his website, It's a, the keyboard is called Response, Response without the E, and his aim is to create something that rivals an acoustic piano particularly the old acoustics of the early 20th century, which he really likes. So in terms of the action, so a ballistic action to replicate an acoustic piano, a sound engine that he said the sound module will be as, as good as anything in a, put in a concert hall. He's got different sizes, you know, sort of personal salon and a concert hall version. And you, you can adjust everything, the action, the weight of the action you can adjust Remarkably, the size of the keys. You can the pianist can change the width of the keys in five or ten minutes from anything, depending on what sizes you pre-order, from three quarter up to over seven inches. And I'm not meant to say how he does it, but that is astounding. And that, that to me, I cannot even imagine how that's possible. That's very cool. It's only possible with digitals, but there is a way of doing it. But I, I'm hoping by the end of the year, the first one will be delivered to the University of Music and Performing Arts in Stuttgart, which is the leader in Europe at the moment through a professor there. And they will have the first one, and there's going to be a teacher out near Melbourne too who's also ordered one of the pre-orders. So as soon as she gets hers, I'll be down there to see it. So we're quite excited about this because it could be a really good option. It'll be more expensive than... You know, it won't be two thousand dollars. It might be six thousand or eight thousand, but it's an op- it's an alternative to an upright piano for a teacher. So they can change the key width from one day to the next if they want to, and the, the students could have a keyboard like Linda's, you know. And so it, it's it just it sounds amazing. I just hope it lives up to, you know, what it's. The website says it does not. I am in touch with Thomas quite often, so just um, just waiting on computer chips for that to appear. That'll be very interesting to to follow along. Uh, I mean, it, it makes me think of you know when I've taught in schools and taught primary schools and seen classrooms. You know, you don't give a seven year old a full size upright bass because they'll like they couldn't even <laughs> it would squash them uh so we give them quarter size half size violins cellos bubble basses guitars so so i mean in that respect it makes sense to me it, it it's it's purely a matter of economics i guess isn't it really when we had uh, before digitals got uh really good we just had upgrades and grounds the, this was an impossibility this is why this hasn't happened but now Digital pianos, uh, I would say that most people are playing on digital pianos of some sort. Yes, the, there's still nothing like a concert brand, but digital pianos are here and they're real. And uh, now we take our pianos to gigs. You used to get a gig in a restaurant, you show up, they had a nice grand piano. How? When's the last time you've been to a restaurant and you've seen a piano there? You bring your own. And the thing I love about the the NK 5.5 is it's it weighs 25 pounds it's something I can take um I just did a little 11 concerts in six days with my sister a two piano tour of a, a small communities and I could I could just lift it bring it in plop it down set it up uh play pain free um and move on to the next it's uh the actual experience of playing it I know I heard on one of your podcasts recently, you're learning Opus 10, number one. And for me, the bear was Opus 10, number four, Chopin Etudes. And you can play it. it, it you can play um, it. But yes, I, I totally, I, I would love to try Opus 10, number one on, on a narrow size keyboard. I think it'd be fascinating. Well, you, uh, Tim, you can come to my house and try it. Well, look, I was going you're to welcome. ask um, Rhonda, hopefully Linda, Linda, you might need to 
um, leave the room and come back. Uh, in the meantime, I was going to ask Rhonda, for teachers who are listening, where can they go to, is there a place they can go to try playing one of these instruments? apart from your house, because that would be a bit of an imposition. <laughs> no, that's fine. The PASP website, which I maintain, uh, lists people around the world who are happy to for visitors to contact them and come to, to try their pianos. And there's also universities in that list. In um, There's quite a lot in the United States and there are some private studios such as Erica Booker in Sydney. So there's, in the PASP website, paspiano.org, there's a page that, says where to try, where you try these keyboards. They go to that page and then the options are universities, private studios, private homes and piano stores, of which there aren't many. So basically the people listed there are happy for people to contact them and that's that certainly includes me. Fantastic. Well, I was In going fact, to ask. Somebody just, someone just came to see me last week from Melbourne, a pianist who several, had got injured from learning several years ago from quite a well-known piano teacher in Melbourne who assigned her Opus 10 number 1, the, ver- the first lesson, and she's, and she's got tiny hands. And anyway, it's, it was just totally inappropriate and she was she just loved the piano and she's actually going to order something from David Steinbill, probably an upright, so... Right. Okay. Well, um, hopefully Linda can come back. We've, for those listening, we've lost Linda. <laughs> she, her internet's jammed up, but hopefully we'll get her back to say farewell. Because I just wanted to um, start wrapping things up, Rhonda, by asking. You mentioned you've got uh, a Facebook group, I think. So how do people connect there? Yes, and I, I sent you a list, which I don't know. Oh if yes, you can we've got share. the PDF as well. Yeah. So we're going to put that right. on um, our there is show a notes Facebook page. Group. There's a Facebook page and there's a group which people who are very interested, very welcome to join. Kathy Strike and I maintain that. And um, it's called PASP.action under groups. But if if you can post the list of links, and there's various websites, um, there's narrowkeys.com, it's PASP, Dear Standard Foundation, David Steinbuehler has converted his business to a non-profit. So I'm one of the directors of that. And so we loan um, keyboards out to universities and music schools around the world. So that's something we do for basically mostly for Yamaha pianos because they're all manufactured to be at the same size, the same standards for each model. And there's currently one in Melbourne at Anam, and there's quite a few in the US, and there's one in Brazil in Sao Paulo, and soon there'll be one going to Chetham School in Britain and. University of Auckland. So we're getting those. That's sort of at the university level where people can perform on them, um, do research, and they're available for students to use. Fantastic. Linda, I was just starting to wrap things up. I'm glad we got you back in the room. Uh, Not sure what happened there, but I was just checking in with where people should go to connect with you. I'm assuming your website's the best spot, or do you have a group as well? Uh, We have a Facebook group, Narrow Keys, and we have a website, narrowkeys.com. Fantastic. And, uh, and, I, we'll, and I know one of your questions was going to be um, how to try them. And I don't know if you covered that when I was gone, but I wanted to say that we're sending out these lovely 3D plastic uh, narrow key. Uh, it's sort of like what List and Group practiced on when they were on the stage coaches between um, concerts. And so if someone, if someone doesn't have opportunity in an area and they're really curious, um, and they want to, um, especially if they want to consider ordering one, they can contact us at narrowkeys.com and we will send them out a 3D model to try out and get the feel of what it actually feels like. They don't go up and down, but they're just hard plastic. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a hard plastic 3D mold of the shape and the size. Yes. Right. Okay. Exactly. Well, that's great to know. Okay. So narrowkeys.com and um, Rhonda is at paskpiano.org. And um, you can search for also the Facebook group. So what we'll do is we'll put a link to the sheet that Rhonda has put together. So for those interested in finding out more, head to our show notes page for this episode and you'll be able to download that sheet for free. Don't need to give us our email or anything. We'll just put a link straight there so people can get connected and find out more. I'm sure there will be some interest uh, from the show. So keep an eyes eyes on your <laughs> email inboxes and things. Uh, I know it's always something of interest to, to teachers around the world. So thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Just before we wrap it, is there anything I've forgotten to ask uh, or any f- sort of final comments? Um, Rhonda first. 
Uh, I mentioned, perhaps I should mention the Stretto Festival, which is part of Ryman in New York initiated that last year. Uh, it was a good thing for the pandemic when people weren't going to concerts. So it started last year. Linda's been part of it both years, where we have pianists around the world playing on narrow keys. doesn't matter what size. They have to be narrower than the conventional. This year we had over 30 performers in five continents. So uh, there was live concerts in New York, and Hannah hosted those. One of the pianists was Roland Pontinen from the famous Swedish pianist, who played on Hannah's 5.9, and he was quite happy with it. He's got big hands, and he said, oh, next time I'll have to play the Schumann Toccata, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's hard for just about everybody and um, or impossible for most of us. Then there were three concerts in Brazil using the keyboard that the foundation sent down there. There were several in Europe in Stuttgart, the the centre of activity there, um, one in Singapore and several in Melbourne. But there's one recorded in my house and two at Adam and a couple in Sydney at Erica Book Studio. So that that festival has got some momentum and Hunter's keen to keep going with Stretto concerts in between the festival and we're currently thinking about what to do next year. Okay. So and there's, the, I assume the there's link, a link on the uh, sheet you've given us. Yeah. That. Great. Yes. Fantastic. All right. We'll make sure that uh, teachers can check that out if they're interested in that. And Linda, anything, any final comments from you? Yes, Tim, I'd just like to say to your teachers, um, embrace this, just like they're embracing all the creativity that happens at your uh, lovely uh, top music website. Um, this is something that I think will make the piano become a more um, accepted instrument now. Guitar has taken over. Uh, ukuleles have taken over. Um, pianos, they're the most amazing instrument. We have a whole orchestra at our fingers. And now, uh, especially with the digital keyboards, uh, it's something affordable to put into your studio. Uh, children with small hands don't have to relearn their technique. It's like putting the right size shoe on their foot right at the beginning. It's something um, to be embraced. And uh, I am so excited about its possibilities. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for coming on the show today and exploring that with us. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Well, that's the end of the show for this week and indeed the end of the main season for 2022. We'll be coming back with you over later in December and January with some From the Archive episodes, which we love sharing. For those of you who might have missed various episodes in the past or ones that have particularly struck a chord with us, we're going to be sharing those over the coming weeks after Christmas. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a listener of this show for many years and um, I really just have had such fun putting it together. Uh, If you didn't listen to episode 300 where we shared a number of voice recordings from you guys saying the impact that this podcast has had, then go back and have a listen to it because it really uh, made me realize just how powerful a medium this is for sharing ideas, connecting people and helping you run the most amazing studios you can because that's what we're all about here helping you do amazing work so that more kids around the world can enjoy and love music and hopefully pass that love on to their own children in time. So I'm going to take a bit of a break for a few weeks now. I do hope you enjoy some of the episodes that we'll be sharing and I look forward to reconnecting with you in 2023. We've already got a calendar laid out for the start of next year. I can't wait to share those episodes with you. I'm Tim Topham. And you've been listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. Have a great, safe, festive season, Christmas. Make sure you get those batteries recharged. Spend time with the family. Make sure you get onto your instrument. Have a bit of a play for your own love and enjoyment. And uh, as I say, I'll speak to you in the new year. Bye-bye, everyone. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. 
If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, visit us at topmusic.co slash podcast or check out the show notes. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, a production of Top Music. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your week ahead and I'll catch you next time.